<clears throat> Thanks so much, Maynard. Uh, it's, it's really a joy to be able to welcome our guests this evening. Um, so our first speaker is Michael Summers. Uh, Michael got his PhD in planetary science from Caltech. He did a, an, a master's in space physics at University of Texas at Dallas. And then uh, and, and now he's um, a professor of planetary biology, planetary science, um, and he studies planetary atmospheres, also teaches astronomy, astrobiology, planetary science, and atmospheric science. Um, and uh, he's, his current research is really exciting. Um, he does a lot of work with on NASA space missions that study Earth from the space shuttle and orbiting satellites and the probe. Um, planetary atmospheres that use uh, deep space robotic missions. He's worked on New Horizons missions, um, on the aeronomy of ice in the mesosphere, and satellite missions to study the highest clouds that are uh, on the Earth's planets. He's also um, a teacher. He's taught a number of courses in astronomy and physics. Uh, today, we're really happy to have Michael here, and he's going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. What, disco what discoveries await us? Michael. Okay, thank you, Gail. Um, I'm gonna make sure I get this up and it's working for everyone. Bear with me a moment. Um, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, it's, it's really a fabulous time to be an astronomer. Um, sorry about my dog. Um, whenever I give a talk like this, I have to go to uh, a, an encyclopedia called an exoplanet encyclopedia to find out how many planets are currently known. I didn't have to do that as a graduate student because there were nine planets and that was that. Never had to worry about the, the list growing. Uh, the last addition to that list was in 1930 with Pluto. But today, as of this morning, uh, I checked and there are 5,002 uh, planets that are known, exoplanets, planets outside of our solar system. And the rate at which we're discovering planets is about two to three per day. And that rate is probably going to go up by a factor of 10 with James Webb. Um, it's also a good time to talk about James Webb. Uh, if you follow these things, you know that um, James Webb was launched uh, uh, Christmas Day last year. Uh, it is now in a commissioning mode um, where it is at its um, station point, uh, L2 Lagrange point, um, uh, with respect to the Earth and the Sun, a stable point. Um, and it's um, going to take another two months or so to check out all the instruments to make sure that everything is working. So far, everything is going great. Um, in fact, just fabulous. I'm just a astonishing that things have been going so well, uh, given how long it's taken us to get to this point. Um, James Webb is probably the most complex telescope that's ever been, been built. Over 15,000 people have worked on it on, in various ways, not just scientists and engineers, but, but many others as well. And uh, it's, it, it's close, another month or two, and it will be fully commissioned and it will be ready to, um, to do astronomy. Uh, as of yesterday, they passed a, a key milestone, cooling one of the instruments, uh, a, an infrared instrument down to a temperature just a little bit above absolute zero, seven degrees above absolute zero. It has to be a very cold in order to be real sensitive to, so that it can detect heat radiation from, from distant objects. So um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, what surprises await us. And, and of, of course, obviously we don't know. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised if we knew what we we're gonna, what we're gonna discover. Um, but looking back over um, the missions that I've been involved in, the NASA missions, the instruments that I've, I've worked with on various teams. Whenever we've had a new telescope, a more powerful instrument, um, a new platform, we're always surprised at what we discover, always. With the New Horizons mission, we had a dozen of the, 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 the world's experts on Pluto, and none of us expected to see um, um, vast plains of organic materials with more carbon per square meter than you find in the Amazon forest, or ice volcanoes, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, or an ocean underneath the surface. Um, we were just surprised, and you could go on and on about the kind of surprises you get at, at other, other missions. I mean, you could talk about this in a variety of ways. You can, you can 
you can talk about it in terms of math. The, the universe is it runs on, on highly nonlinear laws. Um, you can think of it in terms of systems that are coupled. There, there are vast numbers of coupled systems that are, that are unpredictable. Remember the butterfly effect. Um, I like to think of it just in terms of a creator that created something that's vast and complex to uh, show uh, his glory. And um, in a sense, and, and this is just you know, my personal view, I like to think that, that the creator likes to um, surprise us. I, I just think that it's a, it, it's, a, it's a cool way of thinking about things. And I've got a feeling we're gonna be surprised for, for a long period of time to come. So um, I'm gonna talk about some of the science themes uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and I'm gonna go through the, the four main uh, areas where you know, the, the science has been mapped out and there are plans for observational programs. Um, the, the first two on the early universe, uh, black holes and dark matter and all that, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't know much about that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, on, on things I don't understand too well. Uh, I'll give you what the, the themes are, and then I'm going to go on to talk about stars and planets. Planets are what I've been thinking about since I was basically six years old. And then um, I'm going to try to put it together at the end um, to, to give you a sense of, of what we can expect. Maybe not exactly what the surprises are, but just what we can, we can expect to, to uh, uh, what we can expect in terms of progress and understanding uh, some of the, the questions and issues that have been framed. So uh, moving on, let me say a little bit about the James Webb. Again, launched uh, last year, December 25th. It's now at a stable um, Lagrange point. There are five Lagrange points. Let me show you there. There they are. Uh, let's see, three of them are unstable. Two are stable. Uh, the L4 and the L5 Lagrange point with respect to the sun and the earth are the only two that are stable. The James Webb telescope is outside of the, the earth's orbit by about a, a million miles at, at an unstable Lagrange point, which means that about every week or two, it has to adjust its position with, with small thruster, thrusters. Um, and you know it's it's far away from the Earth. The, the Hubble Space Telescope was in Earth orbit, and it was uh, able to be serviced by the uh, the space shuttle uh, to to repair, to replace instruments, and to repair certain things. That's not going to happen with James Webb. It's out there, and it's on its own for um, for several years at least. Now, the 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 the, the, the telescope at this point uh, is fully deployed. And if you've seen pictures of it, you know that it has these big, long sheets, which are shields um, that uh, protect it from the sun's radiation. So it can cool on the side of the spacecraft that has the, the sensitive instruments. On the, the day side, the light side, it's gonna be hot enough to boil water. On the night side, it's gonna be uh, down to, like I said, around seven degrees above absolute zero. The science, theme, science themes. Okay, the early universe. Um, things that you might have heard about before. Uh, inflation is a, is a is an issue, not just with um, our economy. It's uh, it's an issue, uh, a very important issue, in in the context of understanding the early evolution of of the uh, the universe. Uh, evolution is a notion that the 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 universe after the Big Bang underwent a very rapid expansion, expansion even faster than the speed of light, where not just the galaxies and everything in the universe expand, but space itself expanded out, like I said, faster than the speed of light. And what caused that, we don't know, but it seems to be the only way we can explain the smoothness of the universe. There's, a, we've been able to see very far back towards the, this, uh, the, uh, the Big Bang with various telescopes that we've had. And one thing I, I, I need to kind of you know, introduce here is the concept of a light year. Um, astronomers are, in a, in a sense, historians. When they look into space, they're looking at history. Like when you look at the, the moon, you're looking, as, looking at it as it was about a second and a half ago. When you look at the sun, you're seeing it as it was about eight minutes ago. The nearest star 
is what we say about four light years away. So when we look at the light from that star, we're seeing the stars it was about four years ago. With the Hubble Space Telescope, we were able to see back up to a, a time of about 700 million years after the Big Bang, or about 12.9 billion light years away. Uh, very, very far indeed. So far back that we're, we're looking at a time just after the first stars and the first galaxies formed. Not enough to know what the processes were, but enough to see the, the giant galaxies forming um, and getting clues as to what caused them to form. And this is where dark matter, well, one of the, the, the places where dark matter comes into the story. And that is galaxies are, are not technically stable. They should be flying apart or at least expanding outwards um, as, the, as the stars orbit the, the galaxies. And, and the reason is there's not enough visible matter to keep stars in orbit around galaxies. So the inference is that there's additional matter present in galactic halos that we can't see, that doesn't interact with, with light, but it is affected, it does affect gravity. And that's what we call dark matter. And, and understanding the role of dark matter in forming the first galaxies is one of the key questions. And in, in the study of the, er, the early universe. What is the role of dark matter? Now, many think that dark matter could be uh, uh, undiscovered, unknown particles, um, subatomic particles. Uh, some think that it could be a type of black hole. Um, there, are, there are black holes that are known that are of, of about the mass of our sun and a few times the mass of our sun, and many that are, are much larger than the mass of our sun, hundreds of millions, if not billions of times the mass of our sun. Um, but what, and most of the large ones are found in the center of galaxies. So does that mean that the black holes had a role in, in um, gravitationally uh, or, or forming the, the, the early galaxies and keeping them together now? Uh, we don't know. And, and James Webb, it's gonna let us see back further than Webb could, so that we can see right at the time when the first galaxies were forming. In addition to the stability of, of galaxies, their structure is, um, is, is a, a, an interesting issue. I mean, many galaxies are irregular, some are elliptical, many are spiral, like the kind of pretty pictures you see with, with this, the whirlpool galaxy. What caused them to, to, to form in this manner and to become spiral as opposed to elliptical or irregular? Is dark matter the culprit again? What controls the, the, the size of a galaxy? Why aren't they 10 times as big or 10 times smaller on average? Understanding that is not just an academic exercise because stars and galaxies set the stage, so to speak, for the distribution of elements in the universe, the kind of elements that make up stars and planets, and, and in fact, uh, you and I. Now, we can look at the sky in, in many different, what we call wavelength regions. In visible light, that's where we see the pictures of, of the galaxies and planets. But when we look at the sky in, at microwave wavelengths, what we see is that the sky has a rather uniform distribution of, of, of little points that, that look like hot points next to cold regions. And these are really, really tiny fractions of a degree differences, only a few millionths of a degree difference in terms of the, the bright points here you see and, and the blue points here. We believe that, that these bright points where the temperature is a little bit higher represent regions where there's additional matter, like a clump of matter, which could in fact be the first galaxies. But again, we're not quite at the level of depth of being able to see into the universe to understand whether or not that is the, the key to, to the formation of the first galaxies. James Webb, will, will, we expect, will give us that information. Now, visible wavelengths, um, again, we can see lots of stars and galaxies out there. 
this is one of my uh, favorite pictures from the, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and the Hubble telescope several times would, would take a real deep picture of space, not of nearby stars, but away from the stars in our galaxy and look in regions of the sky where what you would see would be mostly distant galaxies. And what you see in this image, every single object here with the exception of two is a galaxy. And this is a very tiny fraction of the sky. This is about the, the, the size on the sky. If you took a dime and you held it, or you set it about 40 meters away, and you look through a little cone about that size at the sky, this is what you would see. And in this image, there are about 5,000 galaxies, an enormous number of galaxies out there. In fact, there are more galaxies, we believe, than the number of stars in our galaxy. You know, are these the end products of those little seeds of clumps of matter that, that I was showing you a few minutes ago? We don't know. That's going to be an interesting question to, to, um, to resolve if we could do that. Now, the, the Hubble Space Telescope can see some very early galaxies and some very early stars, in fact. And just this past week, uh, it was announced that Hubble had seen a, a star that was less than 900 million years old actually less than 800 million years old. And this is a picture of one of the first galaxies that uh, was formed after about 400 million years, or well, 400 million years after the Big Bang. The resolution is not good, the spatial resolution is not good, and it looks rather uh, irregular. Um, and that's about as good as we can do with Hubble. The James Webb is gonna give us structure spatial resolution, spectral resolution, and the kind of information we need to see what these things are, uh, how, they're, how they're coming together, and what is causing them to come together to form the first galaxies. I mentioned the roles of, of black holes. Um, you've probably heard of the LIGO experiment that detects gravitational waves from uh, very massive objects that are coming together and colliding and coalescing like neutron stars coalescing or neutron stars and, and uh, black holes or black holes merging. There's a, there's a big issue, a big question in terms of what controls the growth of, of black holes. Like I said earlier, there are two populations of black holes. One that is you know, from the mass of our sun up to maybe a few times the mass of our sun and then on the other is the kind of black holes we find at the center of galaxies, which can be hundreds of millions to billions of, of times the mass of our sun. When we, when we look at those seeds that I showed you a few minutes ago and, and do a simulation and calculate the rate at which these would grow um, if you had a black hole in the center and, and how the, that black hole would grow with time, we can't explain the, the, the very massive black holes that we see now. We can't explain that. In other words, there's not enough time that has elapsed to grow the largest ones that we see. So something is wrong with our theory, our understanding of the growth of, of these very, very massive black holes. And then, then there are the quasars, which we've known about for, for quite a long time, quasi-stellar objects. Uh, for many years before we had powerful telescopes, they looked like points of light that we knew were not in our galaxy, they're much further away, uh, but yet they were much brighter than other galaxies that we could see at, at similar distances. And now we believe that these are, are actually galaxies that are very what we call active because they have giant black holes in the center where uh, mass is, is, is falling into, and as the mass falls into this black hole, uh, about half of its mass is converted into energy, and we see that energy coming out in, in form of visible radiation, visible light here, and sometimes it X-rays and gamma rays and so on. These, are, these objects are, are interesting in themselves, but because they're so bright, we can see these back to right after the, the Big Bang. And so understanding how these formed can also give us a clue as to how the early universe uh, went from this, this near singularity to stars and galaxies. Okay, that's the, the, the early universe um, and, and some of the questions we have. 
that Hubble will be able to, we hope, address. There, there's a, another issue that's related to the, the formation and growth of galaxies is that galaxies are made up of stars. Stars uh, run, uh, get their energy on nuclear fusion and they create the heavy elements, the things that make up planets. Let me go back. And the way that works is that uh, at least the first stars, the very first stars in, in, in the universe were probably all hydrogen and helium, the, the two elements that were produced in the Big Bang. And over time, the star, at the very center where the pressure and temperature is really high, temperatures get up to above 17 million degrees Kelvin, the, the hydrogen fuses into helium. Uh, helium is a little less massive than the, the, the uh, reactants. And that, that mass difference is emitted in the form of radiation. And that's what causes a star to, to you know, create its own light. Over time, over hundreds of millions to billions of years, the, the star will burn through the hydrogen and run out of that fuel. And when it does that, it will collapse a little bit, actually shrink a little bit is a better word. The temperature will go up and then it will start fusing not hydrogen into helium, but helium into carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and eon, neon and, and silicon uh, and all the way up to iron. And every time as it runs out of one fuel, it gets hotter and it goes to the next, uh, next possible fuel. And so you see that stars over time create the elements. They're like the, the, the manufactories for, for the elements in the, in the universe, all the things uh, heavier than um, hydrogen and helium. Now, if it stayed inside of stars, that, that would be uh, interesting, but it wouldn't do much for planets. What happens though, at the end of a star's life, the star uh, dies, uh, stars sometimes die. And, and it can do that in one of several ways. One is uh, it can become a red giant. In other words, it can get really hot, expand outwards, and, and it, it can become so large that its outside envelope is, is gravitationally bound weakly to the star. And, and that outside envelope would just blow away into space at millions of miles per hour. That's probably gonna be what happens to our sun. We don't have to worry about it. Um, our sun is about halfway through its, its life cycle. In about 3 billion years, we can start seeing the sun uh, expanding just a little bit. And then by 5 billion years from now or so, our sun will be bigger than the orbit of the Earth. The Earth will be, uh, would be uh, rotating inside of the sun if, if the Earth still exists at the time. And, and the, the sun will lose its, a lot of its mass, a lot of those elements into space. And, and this is actually a picture, a Hubble Space Telescope picture of, of a, a star losing its outer envelope of gas, which is enriched in these heavy elements. And this is going into space. This is kind of, this is an example of what we call a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with, with planets. Um, the early astronomers saw these and they thought they were a little round and, and sort of bright things that looked like distant planets, but they're not. These are, um, we call, th these are images of the end products of these stellar winds that come from the giant stars. And the winds carry these heavy elements into space and they will sometimes create rings and arcs of material. In other words, they enrich the, 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 the regions between the stars with uh, these heavy elements. Another way a star can die is through an explosion, a nova, a supernova in this case. This is a picture of the, uh, the, the supernova in the Crab Nebula, which was seen in the year 1054 AD, and it was recorded by several cultures, in particular the, the Chinese. And this star uh, exploded as a supernova. So for a period of a few weeks, that one star was brighter than all the stars in the rest of our Milky Way galaxy combined. And what you see here is the, the elements that were inside of that star that are, that's now being distributed into space. Uh, there is a pulsar, and that is a small neutron star, a star that may be about 10 kilometers or so across that is rotating very fast in the center of this. And that's all that's left. It's like a cinder that's left from that explosion. And I'll skip over that, just saying the same thing. So if you look at the elements 
in the periodic table and find something quite interesting. The only elements that are primordial that come from the Big Bang are the hydrogen and helium. If, if you look at the next most sort of, sort of uh, complex elements, larger atomic numbers like lithium, beryllium, and boron, they come from uh, high energy cosmic rays creating nuclear reactions when they hit elements. But most of the next group of elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the kind of elements that make up uh, the biology of our bodies or the, the, the rocks in, in, our, in our planets, everything here that is, that is yellow and green, those are the ones that are produced by nuclear fusion inside of stars. And again, at the end of their lives, they're, they're ejected into space uh, and it enriches the interstellar medium in these heavy elements. To get the next group of stars, the highest uh, atomic number, requires these explosions, these supernova explosions. In fact, the temperatures get so high in a supernova explosion that you can create all the other natural occurring elements. The temperatures get up to several trillion degrees Kelvin. And at those temperatures, you can fuse just about anything. So there's a recycling of, of stellar material. And the hope is that, that James Webb will allow us to, to, to understand some of the details of this. Stars are born by gravity that pulls them together and collapses into a, an object that will fuse that material. At the end of that star's life, that star will explode in, in one of several ways, and it will send that material back into space, enriches the interstellar medium in clouds of heavy elements, which then will, will collapse in by pieces again and create a next generation of stars. Our sun is a third generation star. The material in your body, other than hydrogen, helium, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the silicon, all the, the elements like those in your body were once inside of a star, most likely close to the center of a star that existed before our sun even existed. We could not exist. Planets could not exist without this galactic recycling. Now, the, 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 the interstellar medium over time becomes very enriched in these heavy elements. And, and you can see this when you look at pictures of galaxies, you see bright regions of stars, but you see darker regions where dust and gas obscures the light of stars. This is a Hubble uh, telescope image again of the center part of what we call the Eagle Nebula, the very famous picture. Uh, and it's, it's very detailed. It's got lots of, of information buried in it. What you can see is clumps of material that are collapsing by their own gravity. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's one. You can see one up here, one right there. Each of those tiny bits will form a new solar system. All the rest of the material here will break up eventually and form new solar systems as well. How does this work? How, what are the details involved? We, we have a cursory understanding of, of that process and, and how stars form and how planets form around those stars and the role of the heavy elements uh, in the composition of, of those uh, stars and planets. And, and part of that comes from direct images of not just the stars being formed, but planets forming around the stars. Uh, this is a picture of a star that has just started burning nuclear fusion um, uh, of hydrogen into helium. And it, you can see rings of material around it. And, and it looks almost like a spiral. It looks like a, a picture of a, of a young galaxy if you didn't know the scale. But that, that material around it is a disk of gas and dust that did not participate in the collapse to form the star but is nonetheless rotating about the star in very hot, and that material will collapse by another type of gravitational process, creating planets. And once you get a planet to form and, and it grows to something as big as, say, Jupiter, then it will start sucking in lots of material by gravity of, uh, 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 around its orbit. And that's what you see here when you see the rings of dark or the dark areas. The dark rings are rings where there is no gas and dust because the planet that orbits there has already accreted all that material. And, and that gravitational interaction can be seen in the distortion of the shapes of these, these rings of material. 
James Webb is gonna let us see this in much greater detail. It's gonna be really exciting to see how planets actually form. This is a picture of, um, actually you don't see the central star, it's blocked out, what we call a coronagraph, but you see rings of material around the star and you can actually see a, a, a planet that's forming near that, that, uh, uh, near that star. And that's the, the bright area right there. That's not the planet. It's not the solid part of the planet. That's a gas and dust cloud, probably a few million times as the volume of, of the final planet. But it's coming together and it's creating and ultimately most of that material will be in a, in a, in a planet. And in, in many regions of the sky, we can look at gas and dust nebula and see this happening. This is a picture uh, in the heart of the Orion Nebula. You can actually see this with your naked eye as a little smear of light in, in the sword region of Orion's uh, belt. And, and when, when we look at this region, we find that this is actually a stellar nursery. This is a place where stars and planets are being formed as we speak. And we can see them. We can go in and look at individual stars and, and planets around them at different stages of their formation process. We can see some, some uh, clumps of matter where the star hasn't started burning hydrogen into helium. And we can see some where the star has formed, planets haven't started forming yet. And then we see some where the, the star is formed and the planets around it are forming pretty, pretty nicely. And we have we, we and we can see these at many different stages, and this is just to illustrate the different kinds of information we have. But each of these is not particularly high resolution. The scale of any one of these images here is much larger than the orbit of Pluto. So we're really not seeing in to the the details that will show us what what is causing uh, uh, giant planet growth like Jupiter and Saturn and then even smaller planet growth, like terrestrial planets, like, like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So here, this is a summary uh, of this part of the galactic recycling. Gas and dust enriched in the interstellar medium uh, collapses by gravity to form spinning dust clouds where the star forms in the center, planets form around it, and ultimately you will end up with, with uh, planetary systems, planets forming around the stars. We, we, we can see these, like I said, um, in the center of galaxies, but there's also a lot of gas and dust that sometimes will, will prevent us from seeing some of the details. And one of the things about James Webb, as I mentioned earlier, it, can, it, it has instruments that we'll see in infrared wavelengths and see the heat radiation right through this gas and dust. So it can see inside of the, the, the giant molecular clouds where the planets are forming. This is an example. Uh, this is again, the, 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 the Eagle Nebula, again, the center part of the Eagle Nebula. And this is an image of what it looks like in the infrared. Now notice over here, you see a bunch of little stars. The brightest ones here are newly formed stars that have just started their, their burning of, of hydrogen into helium. And they've, the, the, the light and the, the wind from the stars has blown away most of the gas and dust, which have a region where a lot more stars are being formed inside of it. But you can't see all of them because they're surrounded by gas and dust. Here, this image, look how many stars you can see. Every pinpoint of light is a star. And so it's not obscured by the gas and the dust. You can see the stars forming all around this and even inside of the, of the nebula. So this is, what the, this is the kind of thing that James Webb is gonna do that the Hubble Space Telescope could not do. And that is see through gas and dust to, to see what galaxies are like in their, in their spiral arms and to see regions where planets are forming like uh, I showed you in the Orion Nebula. Okay, I think I said that. Now, ultimately, planets accrete matter, um, and they will grow. Um, and we've seen various different categories of planets. I mentioned the terrestrial Earth-like planets. Um, these are mostly metal and rock. Um, you get to giant planets. They're like Jupiter and Saturn. They're mostly hydrogen and helium. Uranus and Neptune are, are now what we call ice giants. 
They have a lot of carbon dioxide and water um, and, and, and methane. And, and so they, each of these three different types of planets grow in different ways, but they all grow very violently, at least towards the end part of their, uh, of their growth. Uh, for the Earth, uh, soon after the Earth uh, reached its sort of final mass, or at least about the size that it is now, it was still being pelted by protoplanets, by, by asteroids, each of which are about the size of the state of Texas. And when an asteroid that size hits the Earth, it would vaporize any oceans that were present. In fact, it would vaporize the crust, probably even down to 100 kilometers. So incredibly violent time for the early Earth. But yet, when we look at the geological data, soon after this, we find that there's evidence that there were oceans on the early Earth, that there are chemical signatures that even life that was present in the early Earth. So how do you do that? How do you go from something that is, that is very hot, violent, to something that is more benign and, and have, has life on it? In other words, how does a planet become habitable? And, and this is where the story uh, uh, impacts the, those many planets I was telling you about earlier. If we just had the planets in our solar system to study, we would, we would be fairly limited. You know, nine planets include Pluto, as you properly should. Um, that's not a, a good sampling. But with the exoplanets that I was telling you about, we have a really good sample of, of, of the planets in different types, at different stages in their evolution, and so on. So you can put together a pretty good picture of what, uh, what planets uh, do in terms of becoming habitable. And it's a process. It's like anything else. The Earth has, has changed. It's evolved since it was formed four and a half billion years ago. The early Earth, uh, even after it had an ocean, probably had steam clouds. It was probably very hot, a lot of carbon dioxide. But over hundreds of millions of years, it cooled off. Uh, oceans um, uh, rained out. Uh, they probably were produced by comets and asteroids bringing in water, depositing on the Earth. And when that cooled, uh, you had the oceans and, and you had the stage set for, for life as we know it, liquid water, usable energy and, and carbon, the kind of things that we, we learn about in elementary school that are absolutely essential for life. It's not sufficient for life, but it's a necessary ingredient for life. So how do we study the exoplanets? How do we discover them and then study them? And that's where it, you know, the, the new technology has really played a big role. When, when we look at a star in the sky and we try to see a planet that, that shines by reflected starlight that's close to it, that's a really difficult problem because stars are typically about 10 billion times brighter than the planets that orbit nearby. Um, the analogy that I sometimes use in my class is that detecting an Earth-like planet around a nearby star is like detecting a firefly next to a searchlight, about 10 meters away from a searchlight, at 3,000 miles away. Let's say you're in New York City and you're trying to detect a firefly next to a searchlight in San Francisco. And so it can be done, surprisingly enough. The top image here is um, uh, an image of four planets that are rotating about a central star. And the way you see this is like I showed earlier, we have a, a, a disk that blocks the light from the star. So you only see the light from the planets, but only a couple of dozen of these have been seen. Most exoplanets are discovered and studied by what we call indirect methods. And there are a couple of these. One is that if a planet orbits a star, it will perturb the motion of the star. The Earth going around the star is held in orbit by the sun. So the sun pulls on the Earth, but the Earth also pulls on the sun. Uh, the bigger the planet, the closer the orbits, the larger that pull is. And so if we can measure the motion of the sun, then we can infer with, with high accuracy the orbit, the mass and the orbit of the, the planet. And that can now be done. It's an indirect technique that allows us to detect planets uh, around stars. And, and the techniques are so sensitive now that we can measure the, the motion of a star down to walking speed, 
take a star and it's moving at such a slow velocity about walking speed, one meter per second, at 100 light years away, we can measure that. And so we can infer then planets around these stars. There's another way we can do it. And that is using the, the, the motion of the star to, um, to, to get the, the, the velocity. And, and this plays a key role in that indirect technique, right? And, and it, it relies upon the fact that if a, a light source is moving relative to you, then the wavelengths of any light features will be shifted towards the red if it's moving away from you and towards the blue if it's moving towards you. And so by using this indirect technique and mapping the velocity, we can then infer the, the orbit and, and the nature of the planets. Sorry about my dog. He doesn't like the postman. The other way uh, that's indirect is what we call the transit technique. And here you have a planet that is orbiting uh, a star and we're, we're, we're seeing it as it passes in front of the star or behind the star. And so it, as it passes in front of the star, it blocks some of the light. Now for a big star and a small planet, it's not a lot of light that is blocked, maybe a hundredth of 1%, but we can measure that now. One hundredth of one percent decrease in the light from a star is doable. So this method, the transit method, is actually how we've detected most exoplanets to date. Uh, the Kepler Space Telescope was used to detect several thousand of these. I want to show you some examples of, of exoplanets just to, 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 to give you a sense of how diverse they are. This is the TRAPPIST-1 system. The star is called TRAPPIST-1. The planets are named B, C, D, E, and so on, in order of the discovery. The TRAPPIST-1 star is a, a red dwarf, which is much smaller than our sun and much colder. And the planets that orbit it are orbiting much closer to, uh, and yet are, 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 are close enough so that the temperature on the surface of many of them can keep water in a liquid form. In other words, there are several planets around the TRAPPIST-1 star that are in the Goldilocks zone, and that's denoted here by the green. In our solar system, um, our sun is hotter, the planets orbit much further around and out, and, and only the, the Earth is actually in the, the habitable zone, Mars on the outside edge, Venus on the inside edge, and, and the Earth sort of right in the middle. But here's a system with seven Earth-like planets, three of which are in the habitable zone. This is a pretty astonishing place. Here's another type of planet that seems to be common. About 5% of the planets we detect are ocean worlds or water worlds. Now, now these are not worlds that are covered with water, just covered with water. Um, these are worlds that are water pretty much through and through, over 50% water. So you have oceans that are six to 10,000 kilometers deep. And it's not just pure water either. We've learned in recent years that, that as pressures increase, water phase, water phase will change, not just from vapor to liquid to solid, but at higher pressures, the phases can change even more. And there are at least 20 different phases of water at high pressures. So as you went inside of this plant from the outside to the inside, you would see water changing phase and there would be shells of different types of water. Uh, that, that exist at different depths. And each one, each shell of water would have its own type of water, its own type of viscosity, chemical properties, and so on. 5% of all planets. We, we didn't know if there was any water anywhere else in the universe 30 years ago. And now we're finding whole planets that are made of water. There are planets with, that orbit multiple stars, which was a bit of a surprise because they don't appear to be stable, at, at least at first blush. Uh, the first planet discovered that orbited uh, two closely orbiting stars it is called the Tatooine planet uh, from the, uh, the named after the Star Wars uh, or the, 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 the planet orbiting the two stars in the Star Wars movie. We've now found planets orbiting three stars and planets even orbiting four stars, which you could imagine having a calendar that would be very difficult. There are planets that are mostly metal some are cold enough to be superconducting. Some are hot enough that, that, that it's molten metal. In fact, mercury is about 90% metal. So it it's almost falls into this category. The, the, this planet, is, there's only two of these that, that I could find. Uh, and this is the so-called diamond planet. This is a planet which is more than 80% elemental carbon. 
and you know what carbon is at high pressure. So you know this has a, a this planet has a mantle about six thousand kilometers thick that is crystalline diamond, and the core of this planet is so hot that the the diamond flows as a liquid. So just like you know rock this molten in the deep earth or flow up through cracks and fissures and explode onto the surface, you would have liquid diamond that would explode onto the surface and cool and fracture into to, to, uh, clumps about the size of your fist and rain down diamonds. But the surface is actually black because at low pressure, um, uh, carbon, its, most, uh, it's, it's natural state is, is um, um, a black substance like graphite. The, the most common site, the most common type of planet that we find is, is a little bit bigger than the earth. Um, and we, we call these super earths. Um, the, they, they're usually 25 to say percent to 100% larger in radius than the earth. Now, this is still a little bit tentative. And, and the reason is it gets really difficult to detect planets that are earth sized and smaller. So um, again, this is, this is something that, that James Webb will really help us do, uh, especially determining how planets are distributed in the galaxy. Here's some, just some artist conceptions of these super Earths, a few of them that we think uh, orbit in their habitable zone and that um, uh, would, would be you know, the kind of places you would want to st study really carefully with James Webb to measure their characteristics the composition of the atmospheres and a search for signatures of life. And, and this is you know, a summary plot. It's a little bit busy, so I apologize for that, but it's the only plot that I, I, I know of that sort of summarizes the different types of planets that we find. On the, on the vertical scale, you have size relative to the Earth. So the number four here means that it's four times the radius of the Earth. On the bottom is the orbital period. And so here the Earth is at 365 in a bit. And so when you look at these, you find hot Jupiters, those were the first types of planets found, and cold giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn in our solar system. You find rocky planets, some that are molten, some that are cold. The molten ones, we call those lava worlds. In the middle, there's this huge range of ocean worlds and ice giants. Water is, is you know, abundant uh, in the universe. Now, so far, most of the planets that have been discovered with the Kepler Space Telescope, were discovered in looking by one particular direction along a spiral arm in our galaxy. And this is a, an artist's conception of how that, or, or the region that it looked. Um, but what James Webb is gonna do is it's gonna look towards the center of our galaxy in a beam that will allow them to, dis, to determine how planets are distributed radially with respect to the center of our galaxy and what they are like, what are planets like in the center of our galaxy versus what they're like here. Uh, and, and we don't know what to expect with that. We just don't have any information. Recap, exoplanets are abundant and incredibly diverse. Um, and Earth-like exoplanets are, are even commonplace. And one thing I didn't mention is that many of these planets are much older than the Earth. There's some that are twice as old as the Earth, habitable planets that are 10 billion years old. What, what would the Earth be like in 10 billion years? It's a question that, that James Webb will help us a lot with. So finally, habitability. And I'll try to wrap this up pretty quickly. I'm sort of running out of time here. Lots of questions here that, that summarizes that, that transition from a molten world that's just formed to a habitable world like we have now, and then that has life. You know, how did the, the, the processes convert that planet? You know, physics and chemistry, and even biology in later stages. How do they change the Earth to make it habitable like it is now? And and then of course, you know, what 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 were the processes that led to the the formation of life on Earth? And and can we find signatures of life on other worlds? Um, kind of running out of time. One thing I, I do want to mention is how our perspective on habitability has changed over the years, um, in large part because of our study of exoplanets. And, and the, the, the idea is that um, the, the Goldilocks zone, the habitable zone, is the region, again, the, the range of distances where you can have liquid water stable on the surface of the planet. 
But now we know that many ocean worlds that have even more water than the Earth are covered with ice. And so we see a lot of these in our solar system. The early, the Goldilocks perspective is that the Earth is just right for life, Venus is too hot, Mars too cold. But now we know that there's at least a dozen places within our own solar system that have oceans underneath an ice crust. Three of the moons of Jupiter, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, Titan around Saturn, even Pluto has an internal ocean and so on. Ocean worlds are commonplace. Um, and if you think about the, the, the notion that life on Earth originated in the deep ocean, and we've got a dozen deep oceans in our solar system, makes these places much more intriguing than we thought. Just a comparison of water, there's about 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of water um, on Earth, and, and even the moon Europa has that much, maybe much more. Uh, the moon Titan orbiting Saturn has 13 times that, and so on. So there are at least 10 planets and moons in our solar system that now fall into this new understanding of habitability. Even Mars has, has lakes of salty water underground. I mentioned Pluto. Even the, the asteroid Ceres, which is the largest of the asteroids, has an ocean of, of, of a lot of salt. Uh, it's a very, you know, maybe 30% salt. But it's an ocean of, of brine, basically, underneath an icy, rocky crust. Now, JWST is going to do more than just characterize these planets. It's going to search for signatures of life. And this is going to be, one, to me, one of the most exciting things. And this probably because I'm biased. This overlaps my own research. But by, by looking at how we do this, with James Webb, what, what they'll do is they use a transit method. As a planet goes in front of the star, some of the light will pass through the atmosphere. And as it does that, some of the light is absorbed by uh, atoms and molecules in the atmosphere. And that absorption, the process is called uh, spectroscopic absorption, leads to a signature, which is unique for those elements uh, and, and compounds. So we can look at the signatures of absorption in the light that, from a star that passes through a planet, its atmosphere, and determine what the composition of the planet is. And, and we've done this already for some planets. We found sodium and potassium in the atmospheres of, of um, some planets, even carbon dioxide and water and methane has been found, but it's hard. It's really, really difficult. Um, and, and it's even harder to, to prove that you've got life if you have a certain mix of chemicals. Um, I mean, this is an illustration of how you would look for life on another planet. If you looked at that kind of absorption signature of light for, for Venus and, and Mars, you would see absorption to the CO2, carbon dioxide. If you look at the Earth, you see CO2, but you see, also see water from the hydrosphere and ozone that comes from O2, molecular oxygen that comes from life. So does that prove that there's life on Earth if you were to see the spectra? No. Perhaps there's some other mechanism that produces ozone and water that we don't know of. But this is the kind of thing that James Webb will ha allow us to do because we can look not for these, but for other chemicals and dozens of other chemicals that are metabolic byproducts of, of biology. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. Sorry again, it's taking too long. Um, as of today, as I said, 5,002 confirmed planets, discovery rate of two to three per day. The numbers are just unbelievable. Uh, and we've only searched you know, just a tiny little area of the sky with the, the Kepler Space Telescope. And now we have an all sky survey with the TELS Space Telescope. Um, so what does this mean? The, the discovery rate, the, the distribution of planets that we can infer based upon them, the, um, um, uh, the, 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 the ones we've discovered so far, the numbers are somewhat astonishing. If we look at just our galaxy, 200 billion stars, there are, and if we look at the, 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 the average number of planets around stars, what we find is that in our galaxy of 200 billion stars, there are more than 20, two zero planets for every person that's ever lived on earth. And that's just in our galaxy. And this is 
the other galaxies that are out there in the visible universe in just a tiny fraction of the sky. And so th those, are, those numbers are just astonishing. I like to, to show this to my students as well. Uh, our galaxy, 200 billion stars. If you add up, you have to estimate this, you can't do it accurately, but you can get an order of magnitude estimate. The combined number of heartbeats of all the people that have lived on Earth is one followed by 20 zeros, a lot of heartbeats. The number of grains of sand on all the beaches of the Earth is about one in 22 zeros. If we extrapolate the density of planets that we find around stars nearby to all the galaxies we see in the visible universe, there are one and 24 zeros of habitable Earth-like planets. That means for every heartbeat, for every single heartbeat of every, every person that's ever lived on Earth, there are 10,000 Earth-like planets. And that's a lower limit because that's basically what we can currently detect. James Webb is gonna change that quite a bit. To me, the numbers are more than staggering. I just, I, I look at the sky and, and I just, sometimes I can't even close my mouth. I'm so flabbergasted by, by, by what we see out there. Um, planets are ubiquitous. We didn't know that just a few decades ago. Earth-like planets are ubiquitous and, and, and they're more diverse than we ever expected to see. If, if, you, if you can imagine a planet that, that would fit into the context of a solar system, and it obeys the laws of physics that it's probably out there somewhere. If there's a probability of a planet existing is one in a million, that means that there's a million of them in our galaxy. It's just an, it, it, unbelievable in a way. Uh, the requirements for life, water, raw materials, liquid carbon, uh, usable energy, the commonplace. And they're met on vast numbers of planets and moons and even some asteroids. And so these objects are habitable for a life on for life as we know it on Earth. So the universe is, you know, the more we learn, the more complex we're finding that the universe, more diverse that it is, it's capable, capable of complexity, like life that, that, is, that is impossible to predict because of the nature of the laws of physics and the interaction between uh, systems in, in our universe, their connections everywhere we look between our bodies and cosmic rays formed at the, the edge of our visible universe. And, and again, we're gonna be surprised. I can't answer the question, what surprises await us, but we're gonna be surprised. I can guarantee that. Um, so one final thing, when you go out tonight or whenever you go out again, and you look at the sky, think about this. So every star, so an average one to three large planets, two to four large moons and one to three habitable locations around every star that you see in the sky on average. So um, um, a personal note, if you, if you believe in a creator, you believe in a God of, of that creation, I mean, of the creation that we see in the universe around us, we, we, we struggle to understand the nature of that creator. We even struggle to understand the nature of creation but it does give us a sense of awe at, at what we see. We can enjoy these surprises that, that we see. We shouldn't be afraid of them. This is you know, our creator showing us his handiwork. Thank you. Boy, Mike, that was just fabulous. Tour de Force took us on a tour of the galaxy or at least a portion of the galaxy. Thank you so much. Uh, we have as our respondent today, uh, Dr. Susan Benecki, um, and she is she's done a lot of astronomical research as well. Um, her early work was dealing with the deep ecliptic survey, and um, now she's uh, been working more currently on modeling eclipsing binary systems using a, a variety of different test systems to study them. She's done ground-based efforts describing the ro ro rotational like curvature of some of the other, other um, uh, things that we would find in space. She's also co-authored an astronomy textbook um, that is designed primarily for Christian homeschooling. Uh, it's called The Crossroads of Science and Faith, Astronomy Through Christian Worldview. We're really happy, excited actually to have her be the respondent uh, for this for this lecture. Susan, thank you for being with us. You're very welcome. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead actually and share a slide that I put together while Mike was talking. Um, it, some of the thoughts, Mike, that um, you presented, you did a fabulous job of overviewing a very, very complex project. Um, but the thing that struck me is this idea of multi wave length astronomy. Um, and so I just pulled these out of some of the slides that I show my students. Um, and I also just uh, found a couple quotes that I thought I would share as well as you were talking about sort of the spiritual implications of this. Um, I've always loved the quote um, from Plato, astronomy compels the soul to look upwards and leads us from this world to another sort of looking, looking beyond ourselves. Um, and then Madeline Langle, who is a science fiction author, um, says there is nothing so sacred that cannot be, sorry, there's no, nothing so secular that cannot be sacred. And that is one of the deepest messages of the incarnation, um, giving that Christian spin on things. Um, I just wanted to point out that idea of multi-wavelengths. So we, we're looking at JWST launching, which is awesome. Um, there are a lot of ground-based efforts as well. Um, so I just wanted to give people sort of a visual for comparison. So JWST is looking primarily in the infrared, which is the um, lower left-hand slide. Um, this is Venus for comparison. Um, in the visible, we don't see a whole lot. Um, in the radio, we see the whole surface of Venus. And in the ultraviolet, we don't see a whole lot. Uh, this is uh, Saturn. So again, in the infrared in the radio, visible and ultraviolet. Um, and then this is the surveys that have been done of our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, and so the fact that JWST is, it's JWST, JWST is gonna have these awesome pictures back in time, but I think that the benefit that JWST is gonna offer to um, our culture, our world, is the fact that it's gonna be combined with things like LIGO or um, like the Vera Rubin Observatory um, and those large ground-based surveys, surveys the, um, giant Magellan, Magellan telescope, the um, extra large, the ESO telescope, which I don't know what the title is for that. Um, but just that idea, right, that we can look that much deeper into space um, and uh, try to combine all these different perspectives because looking in one wavelength, we get some information. By combining all of these ideas, we can see a lot more. So Mike, um, the question that I might have for you related to this, um, I say stop, okay. Um, would be, um, you know, both of us are involved with students and both of us have the idea of helping our students see both the physical as well as that spiritual component. Um, what do you think are gonna be the most exciting um, discoveries that students might be involved in or be able to be involved in? Um, and then secondarily, um, what types of um, sort of spiritual implications do you see from any of this, if there is any um, from a Christian perspective or maybe from other worldviews? Um, let me answer the second question first. Um, and you're asking what kind of spiritual implications. Um, I liked your quote. I think everything has spiritual implications. I, I drink a glass of water that connects me to the Big Bang, that connects me to the center of a star, that, that you know, its role is to create these elements for the universe. I mean, how, how can you even distinguish or, or separate any piece of the universe from everything else. It's so interconnected. Um, and if there's a creator, then that creator must have imagined this or, or must have planned it or, or something. We can't grasp that, I suspect. But how can, it, how can anything not have a spiritual implication if you believe in a creator that created this universe? Because you, know, you look up definitions of theology and you'll find various things thrown around, but there's always this idea of theology being the study of, of God and, and his relationship to man. And what bigger relationship is there than creating our homes, our bodies, you know, even our souls. So, uh, I mean, that's just the way I see things that, you know, everything, it has a spiritual implication to me. Um, as far as students, um, oh my gosh, we, we, can't, we can't handle, we can't mentor all the students that want to get involved in exoplanet research. And it doesn't matter what, what aspect of it. I've got students that email me every week They'll say, I'll do anything this summer. J just let me, I'll, I'll go to the library. I'll look up, I'll do anything. Just let me, you know, work, work on this. And, and some students, we can let them work on the data from our telescope and they can, they can confirm exoplanets. They can see the, these indirect signatures of exoplanets and they love that. The kind of work that I do 
that, that is sort of at the interface of physics and chemistry and biology requires mostly graduate students though. And, and so it's a little bit more complex a type of, of project. But, but the, our chemistry majors are, are migrating to physics and astronomy because of this, because you know, that is such a big question. How does physics become chemistry and how does chemistry become biology? And I mean, again, how can, how can you look at the universe that we're seeing now, we're seeing with Hubble and, and Kepler and, and soon James Webb and not get a sense of this unimaginable complexity that must have been imagined by, by a creator, if you believe that there's a creator, that's the outside of science, that's the speculation. Um, so, I, I mean, in terms, again, of, of projects, students just want to be involved. I mean, anything that is exciting is going to um, capture their imagination, and it's going to be even more so with, I suspect, with, with James Webb. I think some of the also citizen science projects might be able to come out of some of the things associated with this to get, you know, even more people involved. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you both. Thank you, Susan, for your uh, comments and question and, and Mike for your answers. We'll turn now to the questions from the audience. And I want to tell people, remind people that there is a Q&A button and you should just push it and enter your questions. We have a few questions in already. So, so we'll start with those. Um, first question, what, what, where, and when was the origin of water? And um, I, I suppose anybody can answer that that knows how to answer it. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, the, the hydrogen is from the Big Bang. And the oxygen is produced by nuclear fusion inside of stars. And so after the, uh, you know, a generation where the oxygen is thrown into space, the, the oxygen and hydrogen um, in part will form water. And, and that's where the water comes from that we find in, on exoplanets. Now, in terms of the evolution of water on the surface of a, of a world like the Earth, um, the, the answer is, is, is a little bit after that in terms of evolution. Like our Earth, when it, when it formed, it probably did not have a lot of water because it was so hot, the water would evaporate into space. Um, but comets and asteroids that were coming in from far out in our solar system, they brought water with them. And our oceans most likely are a product of, of those comets and asteroids raining down trillions of them, you know, 10 to 20 kilometers in size, bringing the water to the earth. So the oceans, um, even though the water came from the same type of physics, you know, in stars, uh, the, 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 the specific water that we find in our oceans were, was probably carried here after the earth had grown to its, its final size or near final size and then pelted to the surface and brought the water. Great. Actually, let me just, let me just add to that. So yeah. one thing that JWST is going to do, so we, I studied the Kuiper belt, all the small bodies in the solar system. Yeah. Um, and one thing that JWST allows us to do is to look in the infrared and the mid-infrared, which is some, an area that is very hard to study from the ground. Um, the objects that we're looking at are teeny tiny, they're faint. Um, and so we just can't see them from ground-based telescopes. And so JWST is going to allow us to actually get real spectra on these things to actually identify those, exactly those components to see what is the composition of the early solar system. Because presumably that stuff has not changed since it was put out there. Okay, okay, let's go on to the next question. Uh, what kind of life might we discover under the ice of the moon of Europa? I wish I knew. Um, we, we, we know that there's a salty ocean underneath the ice crust. Um, we, we don't know the details about the ocean too well. The crust is probably somewhere between five and 10 kilometers thick. Underneath that is an ocean of liquid water, probably a hundred to a few hundred kilometers thick. And that water is kept warm and liquid because of volcanoes at the base of that subsurface ocean. So what kind of life would exist there? Well, if, if you think about that, that picture of the interior of the ocean of Europa, it matches up quite nicely with the deep oceans on the earth. In fact, you probably have mid ocean ridges and black smokers in, the, in, the, in the, the bottom of the oceans in Europa like you do on the earth. There are, there are differences though. We don't know how much energy flux um, is coming out of Europa right now. Uh, maybe there's 
enough energy to power a complex biosphere or, or uh, a biology system in, in the oceans? Maybe not, we just don't know. And we don't know the details of the chemicals that would come out. Uh, clearly Europa has undergone a different evolutionary path than the earth has. So we've, we've got a lot to figure out there before we can, we can you know, try to, to speculate on what kind of life could, could exist there. At least we, we could answer the question of whether earth life, life could exist there. Great. Susan, anything to add? Well, I was just thinking, um, one of the things that I talk about when I get, get to sort of the extra um, planets in our system, in my class, is that we talk about different types of, sort of 10 different types of extreme life. So if you look around on the earth, right, we don't really, the first time people went down to Antarctica and underneath Antarctica, they really didn't think they'd see much. And yet you get down there and you see very interesting creatures. Um, and so, you know, we find life survives in very cold environments and very hot environments down in these thermal thermal depths we see that life is in you know the geysers in Yellowstone so the fact that we see these really extreme um, types of life obviously microbial but different extremes types of life on the earth um, it provides maybe just a small spectrum of, of you know what the possibilities might be <laughs> given and once you get some sort of constraints on the problem. I'd just like to add one, one more thing about extremophiles and I'm glad you brought that up. Most biomass on Earth is not like you and I. It's not like fish and birds. It's in the form of bacteria, extremophiles. In fact, throughout Earth history, at every time in Earth history, most biomass has been extremophiles. And the Earth has not always been like it is now. A half a billion years ago, there wasn't oxygen. If we were dumped there now, we would suffocate. But extremophiles were there, and they dominated life on Earth. Extremophiles, bacteria mostly, but not all, have adapted to virtually every natural environment on Earth. We don't know the extent to which Earth-like life can adapt. I mean, it seems like maybe it's far beyond even the, the, the ecosystems we find on the Earth. And the reason I say that is because we find life on Earth that is adapted to non-natural systems, like coolants around nuclear uh, rods in, in nuclear power plants, you know, in, a, in an environment that would kill you and I in 10 minutes, we found bacteria, Deinonychus radiodurans, that, that can thrive there. And, and the way they've done that is that they've, they've created backups of their DNA, four to 10 uh, sets of backups. They, they have enzymes that can repair the damage by the radiation as fast as it occurs. And they're quite happy, I guess as happy as Deinonychus radiodurans can be, they, they thrive. And so what other kind of environments could Earth-like life adapt to? We don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I've done some work on Deinococcus radiodurans. It's really okay. a cool organism. Uh, let's go on to the next question. Um, what process breaks down the heavier elements to hydrogen and helium in order that they can be recycled into new stars? Um, so once you form hydrogen and helium, it's a rather stable thing. And so you don't really break it down into anything by, by most of the natural processes that, that occur. What, what, the way you change them is that once they're incorporated in a star, nuclear fusion can take them and produce heavier elements. Like you can take helium, take several together and produce carbon and then nitrogen and oxygen and so on. And in, in, on planets, um, on asteroids and comets, nothing really breaks down the hydrogen and helium. In fact, most of the hydrogen is, that's around now was, was produced in the Big Bang and it hasn't really changed a, a great deal except inside of stars. Um, and most of the helium is primordial too. It's changed a little bit, but there's so much hydrogen and helium produced in the Big Bang that it hasn't really affected it totally. Um, the, the stuff that is changed inside of a star is a creation, the formation of, of new heavier elements that were not produced in the Big Bang. And those are then distributed into space that become parts of these giant molecular clouds that, that fragment and create new stars and planets. So that's the way that the elements change is by nuclear fusion. Great, thank you. Um, there are a series of questions that all seem kind of uh, related. So I'm gonna you know, lump them together or they seem to be continuations of each other. What are your ideas and imagination about non-human intelligence and ET UFO, wow. UFO um, other than human forms of consciousness? 
what about the work of Dr. John Mack of Harvard and now through Galileo Project, Dr. Avi Lam? So, um, gosh, there's a, a lot of stuff in, in, in those questions. Um, so everything from UFOs to uh, an interstellar asteroid called Oumuamua that the Avi Lam has written about and, and um, talked about being perhaps a, a relic of an advanced society. Um, so, so just the big picture, I, I would not be at all surprised if there are intelligences out there far beyond our intelligence. I mean, maybe there's a civilization where the, the dumbest one could play 5,000 games of chess simultaneously while composing a mirror fugue or something like that. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't know, you know enough about intelligence to know if there are, are limits. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I would be more astonished if there's not, given so many habitable planets that are so much older than the Earth. Now, UFOs, um, it, you know, it's, it's a different story. Um, I mean, I, when I was very young, I, I was a firm believer that UFOs were visitors from either the future or from other stars. And um, uh, I, I slowly um, moved away from that, be, that perspective because it seemed like that no matter how good our cameras became, the, the UFOs were always right at the fuzzy limit. And even now, when you see pictures or videos of UFOs, with, in spite of all the high resolution cameras on Earth now, and they're everywhere. The UFOs are always right at the fuzzy limit of resolution. I don't see any unambiguous evidence at this point uh, that UFOs are 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 are, uh, are vehicles, say, from an advanced society, either in the future or from another place. I just don't see any evidence of it. I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. I wouldn't be surprised at all if if we weren't being monitored in some sense, um, you know, by an advanced so, uh, civilization. But, and I would love to find that too. I mean, I, th I think it would be exciting to see evidence of a super civilization out there. I just don't see the, the clear, unambiguous, objective evidence in, in UFOs, that, at least what I've seen so far. I mean, every time there's a video, like last year, when uh, the, you know, the, the release of the government report on, um, um, the UFOs that they had been studying, you know, the, the videos that were released were not at all convincing. <laughs> I mean, if you just looked at them at first blush, you say, oh, wow, they're moving so fast. And, and, and you start looking at the details, you say, well, the, the objects are not moving. The plane was moving. You know, it's, it's really little things like that, but added together, it, it makes me highly skeptical. Now, Avi Lieb, uh, he's, he's, uh, <laughs> He's a, he's a smart guy. He's done a lot of great astronomy. He's published lots of papers. Uh, I think he's done a really good job promoting astronomy too, to the, to the public. Um, the, he, he has really pushed the idea that this interstellar asteroid, Oumuamua, that was discovered a few years ago, zipping through our solar system, is a, a piece of a, like a, maybe a part of a solar sail or a, a reconnaissance device of an event civilization. There's no question Oumuamua is odd. Its shape is odd. The fact that it accelerated as it moved away from the, the sun um, without seeing any you know, traces of gas coming off it is a little odd. But the magnitude of the acceleration is just the same as you see for comets moving around the sun. Um, so, it, I, I think it's an unusual thing. I, again, I don't see the evidence as being very strong for the case that it's an artifact. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you, if you think that it's an interstellar or an artifact of an interstellar civilization, you, you, you have to think about what that implies. That means, you know, we just have the capability of detecting that kind of stuff. That means it's probably been zipping through our solar system for billions of years and zipping through other solar systems, and you work out the numbers, that means there's like 10 to the 15 of these things zipping through solar systems throughout our galaxy all the time. It would have to be a very messy civilization that, that messes up its technology quite a bit to have that kind of numbers. But again, we don't know. We, we, we were caught by surprise with this object. We're not expecting to, um, 
to see an intracellular asteroid. Now we know of at least one more that's been detected, Q. Borisov, uh, two years ago. And, and now there's evidence that a, a, a small asteroid that hit the Earth, um, uh, I think it was last year or earlier this year, I can't remember, was a, an interstellar asteroid because of, of its speed. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there. I don't think the interstellar medium is empty at all. Um, you know, drogue planets, you know, vast numbers of comets and asteroids and stuff out there. Um, but I, I just don't buy Lieb's argument at this point. Yeah, and I think along those lines, as we've been studying the asteroid belt and even, you know, looking at Arakoth, right, it's got a very strange shape, it's a very flattened object. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the first time we've actually been able to take a picture of something out in the Kuiper Belt. Um, we're finding actually in studying the binaries that there are probably other objects that are very flattened and elongated like that. Um, the light curve seemed to show that. And so um, I, it's an in, it, I actually worked on um, uh, Lomara, how do you say that properly um, for a while. And um, it is, it's a very, it was a very strange object, but it was here so short, for such a short period of time that the data we have on it is actually quite limited. Right, and so we get one particular perspective. Yeah, the geometry is changing some, um, but you know, it's sort of like a small snapshot of something that you know we don't have the whole story. And so I think now that we're starting to understand a little bit more about our own small bodies and our own solar system, um, you know, there's going to be some extrapolations in either direction. Great, thank you to both of you. Let me uh, let me turn the next for a series of questions about the expected useful life of the James Webb uh, Telescope. Um, Hubble was near enough to be serviced periodically, but the Webb telescope's too far away from that. Um, so, you know, what are they going to do? And then the, the second part to that question is, um, it was very complicated to get this set up. It involved 300 actions to work in a series. What precautions were taken to guard against the loss of the telescope in this critical stage? And then finally, the third part of the question is someone already working on its successor? Oh, well, uh, I, I'm sure Susan will have a lot to add on this, but I'll just say uh, the last question, absolutely, people are, are, are talking about the successor. Um, you know, very large telescopes, so extremely large telescopes on the surface of the Earth that are in the 30 to 50 meter uh, mirror range, uh, robotically built telescopes uh, in space that could be uh, 10 times as big as, as James Webb. So yeah, a lot of people are thinking about the next generation and at, at very advanced levels of thinking, I'll, I'll add that too. Um, yeah, James Webb was complicated or complex and it, 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 it worked, but uh, I was almost a nervous wreck the whole time, every stage. And, and I'm still, you know, um, very cautious about getting my hopes up, even though it's now passed through all these these uh, stages. It's so far away. I don't think there's any hope at all of a of a uh, replacement of an instrument. I I mean, maybe in 20 years we'd have people that could go out there. We'd have the the vehicles that could you know take us out there to service it. I don't think it's going to happen in 10 years. So I think for the next 10 years it's on its own. And and you know. Um, if it loses gyros like, you know, the gyroscopes like Hubble did, I think the engineers are, are incredibly smart and they'll figure out ways of continuing to use the, the telescope. If it runs out of coolant, that's a different story. Um, I don't know, Susan, you want to add anything to that? No, I haven't looked too much into the engineering of it. I do think um, kind of like Spitzer, right, it had some wavelengths that were only good at cold temperatures, but there are other cameras that are operating at other temperatures. So, you know, like anything, you know, Hubble will use down to, we, we, we observed with one gyro mode in the past, right? So we'll use Hubble all the way down to the point where it can't point anymore. Um, and I would expect that JWST will do the same thing. And these engineers are incredibly creative at solving problems that just seem hopeless. Um, and, well, and everything is, you know, there's, 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 um, double or triple, you know, ways Redundant. to do things, um, redundancy, thank you. Um, and so obviously that's something that's built in from the beginning. Okay, I'm gonna do one last question. We're nearing our time. Um, and it sort of is a spiritual question. Um, okay. regard, regarding the spiritual, I think comparing the physical to the spiritual is akin to comparing an orange to existential philosophy. It lies outside our abilities and whatever we imagine is passed through the filter of our limited paradigms. 
Understand any understanding any of it is futile, but our basic nature drives us to figure it out. My question is, why don't we just immerse ourselves in the beauty, the awe, the mystery, and accept it as it is? I'm I like the Zen statement, I am, and that is enough. Mm. Reflections on that, both of you. Um okay. Uh well. The, the last question, why don't we immerse ourselves in the beauty of everything? I said, good, let's do it. That's what I try to do every, every time I walk my dog. You know, I look up at the stars at night or I look at the grass and it's just, it, it's just overwhelming. The, the, the stuff that we're made of, the universe that we're living in, um, and, and the kind of things that we've talked about with science so far, here tonight just barely scratched the surface of the connections between different pieces of the universe. Um, as far as the, the, the first part of that, uh, those comments, I, I have to respectfully disagree. Um, I, I think that any useful belief system has to, to um, incorporate um, objective reality. I mean, if if I believe in a God that has made planets of green cheese, I don't think that's a viable belief. And and we have objective reality all around us. And some things that, that we once thought were supernatural were really natural. So um, I, 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 I guess I, I have a completely different view of that. I think everything around us um, should frame, we should be careful when we step out of science. There's no question about that. The difference between science and speculation is sometimes blurred, but science is using evidence and reason, usually math, to understand the universe. If you don't have objective measurable evidence, then you're, 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 you're right at the border or even outside of science. So maybe there are a lot of questions outside of science that we can't deal with now, like the existence of a soul, the existence of a God. Those are outside of science, at least for now. But to say that there's no connection, I just don't see that. Thank you. Susan, do you want to comment? Yeah, I guess I, I was just thinking um, sort of this, this science fake dialogue that, that exists or doesn't exist. It, I think all of this is really based on um, one's fundamental worldview. Um, if you start with a worldview of God at the center, um, then by definition, I, so because I start from that worldview, um, I would say that I see God's fingerprints in everything that I study. That's just, I just, it's part of, it's part of my study. There's no way for me to separate it from a materialist or a secular humanist worldview um, where matter and energy is all there is. Then looking at that spiritual realm, it, it, it's outside of, it, it's outside of science. It's outside of that component um, of that worldview. And so I think it's really fundamentally sort of a question in, in terms of how you address this question. It's starting from the fundamental worldview that you're coming from. What are the presuppositions of that worldview? And then out of the outflow of that determines whether you look at science completely objectively or whether you see an element of God in that science. Great. That's a beautiful note to end on. I'm I'm grateful to you both. This was just an amazing discussion. I think that there were questions were wonderful. There are accolades about you in, in, in some of the chat. Um, so thank you very much. Your, your talks were very much appreciated. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Maynard who will close out our day. <laughs>